Step in advance. <laughs> They're the part they just say you can do it. <laughs> no, seriously. So, um, you're so smart. So first of all, I had a very concrete place I wanted to get today, and then in preparing things, I realized that I would be going faster than usual to get there. And so, uh, as I started writing down the steps leading to there, I was I was like, wow, this is enough as it stands for uh, one whole lecture. So we're going to talk today about some uh, important ideas, so that when we come back next Friday we can uh, be a little bit more prepared to talk about the implications of these ideas for the black hole information paradox. But since it's been, oh gosh, how long has it been? It's been like three, three weeks. weeks. It was before spring break, right? Yeah. So this is four weeks since our last. Right, uh, index at zero. Anyway, uh, so uh, the black hole information paradox in a nutshell, just to remind you of where we left off, uh, is the following idea. Um, I have some information. And last time, our favorite piece of information was Wolfgang. <laughs> you yeah, have Wolfgang. Yet. It's not been a 24-hour window Cow. since part of the visit. What's our favorite piece of information? Can anyone want to help him? Not your mom. What were we throwing into the black hole? A cow. A cow. Oh, yes. Something <laughs> a cow. Oh, not Oh, I'm so, uh, so here's the context. We have a black hole that has a mass M. We take some information. It can be a cow. It can be Wolfgang. What's the difference? And we throw it into the black hole. And the result of that is a new black hole, which is a little bit bigger. But the difference is purely reflected uh, in the mass of the black hole. Okay, So all the information about the cow is lost except for its mass. Okay, that's a lot of information that you lose. Now at this stage, um, this is okay because the information is hidden uh, behind the horizon. So if we talk about the overall amount of information in the entire universe, we could argue, well, what's inside the black hole is still part of the universe. So even though we can't see that information, it's still part of the universe, so we haven't really lost information. Um, but then Hawking had to come along and say, no, 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 uh, black holes will actually radiate. And the Hawking radiation for an isolated black hole, okay, it has to be isolated because generally black holes accrete matter faster than they radiate, especially large ones, so they would never actually disappear. But if you have a black hole in isolation, it would eventually radiate completely away. Um, and the Hawking radiation uh, which is thermal, uh, has a temperature T determined by the mass of the black hole. That, uh, it's actually the temperature of the Hawking radiation at any time is determined by the mass of the black hole at that time. So the temperature profile changes as the black hole mass changes. But, but nonetheless, uh, at each stage, the temperature is only determined by the parameter M. And of course, at the end of this process, uh, no horizon is hiding the information that we threw into the black hole originally. And so this implies that information is lost. Okay. And um, this uh, predicament sparked a debate uh, that um, played out for quite a long time. And it, it implies that there are uh, two possible ways to address this inconsistency. One is just to accept that information is lost. Boo-hoo. This is just the way it goes. Uh, the problems with admitting that uh, information is lost is that this implies non-unitary evolution of the system comprised of the entire universe. Uh, but non-unitary evolution uh, breaks quantum mechanics. And so uh, if you're going to accept that, uh, that this is uh, just a reflection of the non-unitary evolution of at least gravitation, gravitational quantum systems, then you're going to have to rewrite quantum mechanics. Um, it's not obvious how you do that. Uh, if, on the other hand, Hawking was wrong, that is, something was wrong in his calculation of this, for example, maybe it's not purely thermal, maybe it doesn't radiate at all, who knows. Um, then there's a couple of 
things that we're going to have to give up. Uh, one is that perhaps uh, effective field theory fails. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, Hawking was doing uh, basically effective field theory calculations. And, and the word effective field theory is essentially, and those in particle physics will learn a little bit more precisely what this means at the end of the semester, but effective field theory is essentially um, you have an underlying fundamental theory, and sometimes you don't understand exactly what that is, but if you're not probing the theory at arbitrarily high energies or arbitrarily short distances, a lot of times you can get away with a description uh, that's sort of more tractable. So we do this all the time in physics, right? We, we approximate an atomic system in terms of a continuum. So we talk about water as a fluid, but it's not really a fluid, it's a collection of uh, molecules. Uh, but we get a lot of really useful results from studying um, these kinds of effective descriptions. And in particular, uh, effective field theory is essentially what Hawking was using when he derived the, the Hawking radiation. Um, because he wasn't working with a quantum theory of gravity, right? Um, so, so maybe effective field theory fails, that's not a particularly good thing. Um, or maybe uh, one of the fundamental principles of general relativity fails and one that typically is considered as the equivalence principle. Okay, and next week we'll kind of come back and talk about uh, the exact way in which people think the equivalence principle might be failing. Uh, but the equivalence principle is sort of one of the bedrocks of general relativity, and it just says that in an arbitrarily small region over an arbitrarily short time, you can replace a gravitational field by uh, a uniform acceleration. Okay, so it lets us kind of get rid of gravity by going to a uniformly accelerating frame. And this is so, so this is the idea that if you jump off of a cliff and you juggle, you can't really juggle because there's no more gravity to help you. So, uh, all right, so those are the sort of the consequences. There was a debate. A lot of people really wanted to hang on to information. A lot of people really wanted to hang on to effective filter and equivalence principle. And then this was partially resolved by the ADS-CFT correspondence, uh, which said that uh, many gravitational systems, okay, those that are embedded in asymptotically anti-dissider geometries, but they're nonetheless gravitating systems, so they include general relativity, uh, those gravitating systems can be completely described by non-gravitational uh, quantum field theories, but non-gravitational quantum field theories are unitary, they preserve information. And so if these two things are equivalent, then the unitarity here has to be reflected here. And so there was this idea, yeah, the, this is the way things have to be resolved. Somehow this something here gets screwed up, okay? And this was sufficiently convincing to Hawking that uh, as I ended last time, in 2004 he admitted defeat uh, and actually provided his own sort of explanation for how it worked, which was just sort of a uh, generalization of what, of what Malvasina had already done in this context. Okay, so um, certain people are not uh, satisfied by that, Madison among them, and people <laughs> didn't stop thinking about it, okay? And, um, and the truth is, is that even when Hawking made his presentation, even when Malvasina kind of worked out his example, uh, they admitted that there were a lot of details that needed to be fleshed out. For example, uh, exactly what is it that's failing, okay? Can we be more uh, quanti quantitative in talking about how things fail instead of drawing out this Feynman expansion, describing the collapse and then a, a, a evaporation of a black hole, and then saying, well, these are you know, these, these states which I can't really po point at because I have to take the whole thing into consideration. They might or might not be, there might be a black hole, there might not be a black hole, I don't know. Okay, so, so some people were bothered by this and they wanted to think a little bit more carefully about it and it kind of got a resurgence Oh, probably about five or six years ago, and it's really been sharpened and made more problematic, in fact, uh, in the ensuing time. So what I want to do today is kind of talk about some of the basic ideas that have been brought to fore, um, and, and then probably next time is when we're really going to get into what some of those ideas are. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, any questions? This is just a quick review of what we did last time. Are there any questions lingering about that? So we're going to find new problems. This is, you know, this is still a problem in the sense that we haven't completely figured out how it works. We, 
It's not a problem because we still think there's two options. We kind of think, okay, information is preserved. We just got to figure out how to describe what's screwing up here, okay? Um, but in the process of, of what people have been looking at since then, there's actually new problems that have emerged, and we're going to talk about those in due time. So what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a review for some of you. For some of you, everything I'm going to talk about today is going to be a review. And I'm sorry, Zach and Wolfgang and Will, <laughs> but uh, you're not the only ones in the room, so you've got to kind of get everybody up to speed. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right, so a lot of this uh, story and uh, a lot of the ideas that have been brought into it uh, revolve around the notions of information and in, in the more sort of quantifiable uh, physics way of handling information, uh, the concept of entropy. Okay, and I will admit entropy is one of those, I mean, how many of you in the room are comfortable with your understanding of entropy? Okay, let the record show that Kellen and Jacob thought about raising their hands. <laughs> Caroline didn't even look up. <laughs> Not me! Hell no! I got no idea. Okay, but the truth is, is entropy is like, entropy to me is, is kind of like spinners. <laughs> like who's comfortable with spinners? But I will say I'm way more comfortable with spinners than I am with entropy. I just, entropy is still this really weird thing. And, um, and it gets weirder, like, you know, you're, you, you saw it in your thermodynamics class, you see it in your thermal physics class, and then you start talking about entropy and, well, <laughs> in principle, you saw this in your thermodynamics class, in principle, you saw it in your thermal physics class, uh, but then it gets even weirder because you can talk about it in quantum systems and so forth. So, so I'm going to try to kind of give you an outline of some ideas surrounding entropy. You probably still will leave uncomfortable with the notion of entropy, but that's okay. Um, so uh, a, a heuristic idea of what entropy is, and the one that I kind of am most comfortable with, um, is the following. Entropy is a measure of what we could know, but choose not to know to know about a system. That is more confusing than any other. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, just, the definition in words is going to feel very nebulous and you're going to be uncomfortable with it. But here's the point of this. We're going to look at several different definitions of, concrete definitions of entropy. And what I'm trying to get is a set of words that is broad enough that it applies to all of them. Because the definitions we're going to introduce are going to look very different from each other. But if you're going to have some single underlying concept of what entropy is, you want an idea, a set of words that is broad enough to apply to all of those. So, so I know this seems nebulous, but, but we'll see in a lot of examples this borne out and what exactly I mean. Now, first of all, Entropy is a sort of a measure of what we know. So there's the information. Information is what we know and what we don't know. Um, it becomes sort of a weird thing to think that what I know is physically important. Like, can I make a car go by knowing more? You know, can I make a ball fall by knowing something? Like, what is the physical? I mean, we're getting into some really weird quantum mysticism shit here, right? <laughs> The more you know, the more powerful you are in the physical world. And that always bothered me in my first sort of rounds with entropy when I was a young toddler. And, um, and the truth is, though, if you really think about it, all you have to do to understand sort of the physicality of entropy is just to think about how you know things. How do you know things? Measuring things. You measure things. But when you measure things, what do you do? You change your systems. You interfere with systems physically. I mean, you can talk about collapsing wave functions, but you don't even have to be in a quantum system to do this. You can take classical measurements, and classical measurements are physical interference with the system. Okay, so the process of gaining knowledge or the process of losing knowledge has physical consequences. So, for example, you know, if you want to lose a lot of information about a system, you can take a perfectly ordered system and you can couple it to a heat bath. And then that's going to randomize and you're going to know a lot less about it, but there's a physical exchange 
going on because you know things are beating on a wall and they're beating on the things in here and eventually all this physical stuff leads to this disorder and this lack of knowledge. So the idea of knowledge or information as uh, reflecting physics, it's, it's not that cray cray. Uh, it's a little bit cray cray. Not that cray cray. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm going to start with uh, what we might call the classical idea of thermodynamic entropy. And when I say classical here, I do in part mean non-quantum, but I also am really referring to like old, old school entropy, like before the modern advent of statistical mechanics and, and so forth. So, um, so how does, uh, you know, how did entropy first enter the story? And many of you, I don't even know where you see this. You like see this in chemistry first? Like where do you see the first law of thermodynamics first? Is it in chemistry? First, first law? law? Which law? The second for entropy. But if you're talking about the the definition of like integral of like Q over or something else, like that was two ten. Yeah, I, I don't remember where I first saw the notions of entropy or the thermodynamic relations first. It must have been history. It wasn't in physics because it take physics to college. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But anyway, uh, so uh, for macroscopic systems. Um, and we're going to consider uh, reversible processes from, uh, from one equilibrium configuration to another. We have the following expression. Okay, where this might not be exactly the form of this relation that you've seen before, but it's one that's particularly useful if you want to apply this thermodynamic prescription to black holes. Uh, but here, obviously, this is the change in energy of the system. Okay, this is the temperature. Uh, this is the angular potential of the system. Okay, you probably haven't studied this too much in classical thermodynamic context, but you can actually apply the concept of uh, this is basically just conservation of energy, but you can apply that to a system if you just take the system and rotate it, which clearly has an analog if you talk about a black hole because you can rotate a black hole. Um, and this is the change in angular momentum, the electric potential, if you're going to go ahead and give your system some net charge, and then this would be the change in charge of the system. Okay. Kellen, you were going to ask a question. Uh, does angular potential have anything to do with solid angle, or are those like very separate? Very separate things. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. What am I? What am I? Yes. Okay. So um, all of these quantities: energy, temperature, entropy, the potential, the angular momentum, the electric potential, and Q, are uh, state variables. Can you remember what a state variable is? It's like has a start and end point. Yeah, it, it, all, the, all a state variable cares about is the state of the system at a given instance. It doesn't care how you got there. Okay? So there, there's no hysteresis that's captured in state variables. Okay, and, and generally speaking, if we have a macroscopic system, we can sort of identify its macroscopic state by specifying these quantities. Okay? Now, is that complete? <clears throat> Is that a complete specification of what's going on? If I give you a box with an Avogadro's number of particles in it, and they're flying around, and I tell you, this has energy E, temperature T, entropy S, blah, 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 blah. Have I told you everything there is to know? No. Hell no. OK? So this is a very coarse-grained description of the system. OK? I'm not asking for you to specify every single thing associated with the system. OK? And we're going to come to, to how that connects with statistical mechanics in just a minute, okay? But whenever we um, are considering a macroscopic system, without having to go any further with statistical mechanics or anything like that, if I identify that the system has a temperature, by the sort of classical idea of, of thermodynamics and entropy, I can say, oh, that system has an associated entropy. Okay, so thermal systems have an entropy. Now, explaining where that entropy comes from, uh, is a different problem, but essentially what Hawking did when he calculated the radiation uh, from a black hole was he said, oh, the black hole has a temperature 
And therefore, you can directly argue, therefore, it has an entropy. Of course, it had already been argued that a black hole had entropy, okay, from other, from other, on other grounds. And then you can actually, you know, fix the coefficients that relate those two in terms of black hole parameters. Okay, so that's one sort of your first initial introduction to entropy. Seems a little nebulous at this point, you know. Energy kind of makes sense. Temperature kind of makes sense. This is just weird. And this shit's kind of just, I don't know, it kind of makes sense. All right, so um, everything makes a lot more sense, presumably after you finish taking thermal physics. <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, so in this expression, I'm going to, and because I'm going to introduce several different entropies, I'm going to call that the ST, the thermal, or the thermodynamic entropy. So um, in, in statistical mechanics, the idea that these things are coarse graining is really explored, okay, and it's given sort of a quantitative foundation, and you can kind of start from sort of first principles and build up to these relations. So statistical mechanics is giving you the sort of microscopic derivation of these macroscopic relations. And the way that it works is basically uh, as follows. Given a coarse grain, and I'm going to speak in kind of general terms so that we can apply this in different contexts. Given a coarse grained description, Um, and coarse grained can be in terms of these quantities, or it can be kind of determined. It can be it can be any kind of average quantities where you're not actually looking at the explicit independent values of the various uh, bits of what's going on in the system. There are usually many uh, fine grained uh, resolutions. Uh, compatible with the coarse grain description. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so a resolution is you're looking at smaller and smaller scale resolving, and a resolution is sort of, well, what if you just looked at every single possible piece of information you could, okay? And the issue is, is that in general, not always, but in general, if I give you a set of coarse grain quantities like these, there's typically a lot of different configurations that are compatible with it. And so in, in thermal physics, you would have said something to the effect of, for a given macro state, there are a lot of compatible micro states. Okay, so lots of different microscopic configurations which correspond to the same values of these. Therefore, knowing these is not complete information. So there again, we find the information component of the story coming in. Okay? Um, so if a resolution, so one of these microstates, if a resolution has probability pi, that is, all I've specified are the macroscopic quantities. I've got this box, it's got some stuff in it, and I say, what is the probability that this particular microscopic configuration is what's really there? Okay, that'll be pi. Um, then, and of course, uh, as probabilities, these have to satisfy that the sum over all probabilities is one. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense to call it a probability. Uh, then we can actually define the statistical entropy of the system, which I'm going to call SS, to be proportional to minus the sum over i, pi, ln pi. Okay. Okay, and, and the constant of proportionality, as you're all aware, if you've taken thermal physics, is just Boltzmann constant, Boltzmann's constant K. Um, but there's, so this is sort of a, the, 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 the broadness in which I'm applying this is in sort of an infer, information theoretic context. You don't have to apply it to a thermal system, okay? You could just talk about instances of things with a probability distribution and then talk about the information entropy associated with it. If we're talking about thermal systems, though, the proportionality constant is clearly going to be K because eventually you're going to take this and you're going to extract thermodynamic quantities from it, and those have physical dimensions that you have to, to explain. 
Okay, so we'll just go ahead and put decay in there, and uh, that's our definition of statistical entropy. And let's just see for a couple of simple cases, because I think simple cases are always where you know a definition kind of uh, bears out its relevance. Let's see if this makes sense. So um, we've got this system. We've defined you know some macroscopic quantities, the, no, the energy, the number of or the volume, the number of particles, and you know it's, it's some particles or whatever. And what if I find that uh, the probability of one configuration is just one, and the probability of all of the others is zero. So there's really only one compatible microstate with this prescription of macroscopic variables. What's the entropy? Zero. 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 Okay. But that's what you would expect. Because if there was only one compatible microstate, then that means that knowing these variables is equivalent to knowing the microscopic description of the system. There's no information that you don't have in this prescription. Okay? All right. So, um, okay, so, so generally I'm going to write an expression that's going to look a little suggestive. Um, and, and we'll see why in a few minutes. But, but generally speaking, one way to think about um, uh, giving a coarse grain description of a system is by thinking about the following. There is a state of what we know, <laughs> and it is a sum over compatible resolutions. Okay. where each resolution carries uh, uh, with it some probability, some classical probability for actually being the resolution that we're actually, uh, that, that, that is actually being physically realized. But we don't know which one it is, okay? Now, um, to actually see how we use these ideas in thermal physics, uh, first of all, this kind of idea that instead of saying we exactly know something, uh, rather we have several possibilities and then we know what those possibilities are and we know the probabilities associated with each one, okay? This is what is often called an ensemble. And the word ensemble is of course meant to invoke a collection of things, but it's a little bit more than that because it's not just a collection of possibilities, but you also know the probabilities associated with each one, okay? So um, it turns out that when you are applying statistical mechanics to thermal, thermal systems, there's a couple of different sort of paradigms in which you operate, and uh, many of you have probably seen these. There is, for example, the microcanonical ensemble, Wolfgang. How do we define the microcanonical ensemble? Yes, I'll just I, I'll say what you just whispered in my ear. Um, <laughs> For the microcanonical ensemble, we consider some system and we fix the total energy of the system and the total number of particles. So we're kind of we're not letting energy flow into or out of the system, so it's isolated, and we're also not letting the number of particles change. And um, in that context, if we enumerate all of the microscopic configurations that are compatible with this, what we find is that the natural probability assignment to each of them is just that every, every possible configuration is equally as probable as another one, okay? So that means that PI is essentially one over the number of microstates. So if you have a thousand microstates that are compatible with the specification of EN and all the other variables like V and so forth, then um, if each of them are equally probable, the probability of one of them is just one over a thousand, okay? Now we can of course take that and we can throw it into the definition of the statistical entropy. And if we throw it into the, the, the definition of the statistical entropy, then this is just reduces to k times the natural log of the number of microstates. Okay? Where there was a little bit of, of, of log gymnastics uh, when I plugged that in. And then I also used the fact that the sum of the probabilities is equal to 1. Okay? So I'm sure you could, you could piece through the, the details if you need to. Okay, so this is an expression that many of you saw early in your thermal physics class when you talked about the microcanonical ensemble. Entropy is k times the, net, the natural log of the number of microstates. A more interesting ensemble 
is the canonical ensemble. And we define the canonical ensemble by fixing the temperature and the number of particles. And one of the important features of this ensemble is that by fixing the temperature, we actually allow the energy to fluctuate. We're not fixing the energy itself. Okay, so it turns out that for a fixed temperature, a given system can actually, it can exist in a range of energies. They're usually a sort of a narrow band around some average energy. Um, but the energy itself is a quantity which is not fixed. And so in this situation, it turns out that each microstate is not equally probable. Rather, and you can look at different distributions, um, but the simplest is the Boltzmann distribution. And so we have a probability of a, a microstate being proportional to the exponential or negative the exponential of the energy of that microstate over KT. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now, this factor z here is just because if I didn't have this and I summed over all the pi's, there's no reason why that sum would be 1. Notice here, by definition, if I sum over i, and this is the number of i's, then the sum of that is 1. But if I don't have this 1 over z and I just do the sum over all of the i's here, it's not necessarily 1. So z is just a normalization factor. In fact, we can write down what that normalization factor is. It's just the sum over i e to the minus i. Do e e <laughs> too many path integrals. Um, e to the minus e i over k t. And of course, uh, so now it's obvious that if this is the definition of z, then when I sum all the probabilities over i, I definitely get one. But of course, this is the central object that you end up working with in thermal physics. What's it called? Partition. That's the partition function. Okay, this is the thing. It's the generating function for a lot of thermodynamic quantities, and so that's really it's sort of, it's funny. It's a normalization factor, but it turns out to be the central thing that you work with most often in thermal physics. Okay, so in terms of uh, the canonical ensemble, uh, if we apply uh, this set of probabilities again in this definition of the statistical entropy, then what we find is that in that case. This reduces to k times the natural log of the partition function plus the average energy whoops, over t. Okay. And um, now, just, just to make sure that, so, so this definition follows from plugging this uh, into this definition, but let's just make sure that this is sort of an intuitive conclusion in the same way that we decided this was an intuitive conclusion. Uh, based on, you know, if you only had one compatible microstate. So how do we get a single compatible microstate in the canonical ensemble? There's only one so, allowable energy. Well, in terms of things that we actually tweak, how do you get to a single compatible microstate? Zero yeah, you go to zero temperature. Okay. The thing is, is when you're at really high temperature, there's lots of different configurations that are compatible with a given temperature. But when you go to zero temperature, everything's in the ground state. And there's a unique ground state, okay, generally. Okay. So if you, go, uh, if you go to t equals zero, then it turns out that the only contribution is from the ground state energy. And in that context, this guy actually just becomes minus E zero over t. This is just E zero over t and the total entropy of that system goes to zero because if you know the microscopic configuration, you know everything, there should be no entropy. Okay. All right, uh, the last comment I'll make before we move on to something that's not quite a uh, review is that in all of this, um, if I take uh, a, a system A with some entropy SA, and I take a system B with some entropy SB where A and B don't overlap, okay? Then the entropy of the composite system, A union B, is just the sum of the entropies of A and B. That's just the statement that entropy is an extensive quantity. If you have, you know, the entropy of something, the entropy of something else, the entropy of the total is the sum of the two entropies. And you can use the, uh, the extensiveness of entropy directly to argue that entropy should scale like volume. Okay. So 
Um, all right, any questions about this stuff before we move into something that may be a little bit new for some of you? All right, here we go. Is it, do you guys remember all this? Okay, kind of. I see hands waving. It's always a good sign. For some of you, you can look forward to learning this in depth, in detail, when you take thermal physics. <laughs> it's not possible. Okay, I am, I'm erasing all this, and I'm so going to regret it later, but whatever. Okay, so, um, now it's time to go quantum. Okay, so first of all, um, what I talked about with statistical entropy here, Oh, there it is. There it is. Statistical entropy. Um, the story of statistical entropy usually itself hinges on using quantum mechanics, right? Because one of the things that we know we're doing is we're trying to count the number of microstates. But if you have a classical system, that's usually a very difficult task because there's an infinite number of states. So the way we make the calculations tractable in statistical mechanics is we put the system in a box and then a lot of things get quantized and then once things are quantized we can actually count. Okay, That's why you probably never applied statistical mechanics to unbounded systems because everything's continuous and it's crazy to try and ask how many places can a particle be? I don't know. How many momentum value values can I have? I don't know. It's continual. So, so, so when I say well, I'm going to talk about quantum and entropy it's already part of the statistical story, okay? And next time we meet, we'll, we'll kind of, uh, we'll enhance the connection between what I'm about to talk about and uh, the appearance of quantum mechanics and statistical entropy. Um, but for now, we're gonna talk about something called the von Neumann entropy. So this will be our third form of entropy. And um, the von Neumann entropy is something which you can define for a quantum system and, um, the, among the many interesting things that happens when you go to quantum systems is the following. Um, in a classical system, we can say something like, oh, I'm going to choose to not know the details of what's going on. So I might say I'm going to only know the energy and the volume and the pressure and the temperature. But in principle, if I had enough time, I could go in and I could measure every single thing that's going on with every single particle, and I would then have complete information. Okay. In quantum systems, that's actually not even possible in principle because of uncertainty, right? So we know in quantum systems, generally, we have non-commutation between, uh, say, the x component of position and the x or the x position and the x component of the momentum. And so what happens is, uh, generally speaking, if we go and we measure, for example, the position or sorry, the momentum. So we say, oh, this particle has this x component of momentum, we generally are uncertain in the position. Okay? So in quantum mechanics, there's a limit to how much you can possibly know. And this is reflected in the fact that when we specify a quantum system, or the state of a quantum system by psi, in general, this can, can be a superposition state. Okay? Now these CIs, now this looks a little bit like what I wrote earlier, right? What you don't know, sum over pi ith resolution. Okay? But it's not quite the same because of two things. Number one, this is not a set of probabilities. You can get the probability of finding this result if you do a measurement uh, by taking the complex magnitude squared of that. Okay? But what's different and what is really hard to wrap your head around is the fact that this is the state of the system, period. This is a full specification of the state of the system. The fact that it's given by a superposition of possibilities, it doesn't matter. Like, that's it. That's, that's a full quantum specification of the system. So there's a sense in which writing down a state vector, even if it's a superposition, is still specifying a single microscopic state of the system. You've measured everything you can know. All right? Again, the fact that it's a superposition, just it's reflective of the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. 
Now, um, now what we would like to do is we would like to somehow define an entropy for quantum systems so that if I give you this thing, then the entropy associated with that amount of knowledge should be zero. You know everything. Okay? So this is what I want, and it turns out that there's a way you can define this, but there's an intermediate step you have to take to get there. I'm going to switch to a marker that's actually working. And this intermediate step is that we have to introduce the notion of a density matrix. Sweet. <laughs> Didn't I put the cap on before I threw away? It looked like you did. Oh, uh, why? I don't know. People might like see, like, you know, you know, guard, like dumpster divers, like, oh, there's a marker. I'm gonna eat that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna lick that. <laughs> Maybe they like to huff markers. You know? <laughs> uh, anyway, what the hell was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, density markers. matrix. So um, we can introduce a density matrix, uh, which is just an outer product of the state uh, vector or the state ket with the state bra. Uh, for those of you who haven't taken quantum mechanics, these are kets, these are bras. So together in the other direction, we make a bra ket. Um, and, and then once we've defined this quantity, the density matrix, then uh, we can define the von Neumann entropy to be minus the trace of rho log rho. Okay, and it turns out that this definition of entropy is going to reduce to this and I'll show you why in just a second. Um, but it's also going to lead to some very interesting uh, new ideas for quantum systems. So let's first of all um, see how this reduces to what we expect. So let me give you a system in a particular state. So again, I'm going to write it as a superposition, but it is going to be a, I am giving you the state of the system. So I'm going to have, for simplicity, as we always do in quantum mechanics, I'm going to consider a two-state system, so you might as well just call it spin up and spin down for some spin half particle, doesn't matter. And its state of the system is going to be as such, okay, with some complex coefficients a and b. Again, this is a superposition, but nonetheless, it is itself a pure state. And then we, of course, always have the normalization condition that the sum of a squared plus b squared is 1, because remember, a squared is the probability of this configuration, and then b squared is the probability of this, and the probabilities have to add to one. Okay, so um, so now let's form the density matrix. And if we form the density matrix, we're literally going to take this thing, and we're going to multiply it by its ket form, and, and the, 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 or sorry, the, uh, this is the ket, we're going to the ket, and then we're going to multiply by the bra, and the bra is literally just a, complex conjugate of the coefficients, and then the bra form of the state vectors. So there's nothing mysterious here. I just flip everything around in direction. Okay, and then you can actually do this matrix multiplication, and if you do it, and you actually express this as just a little two by two matrix, uh, which you don't have to do. You can leave everything in terms of bras and kets for the manipulations that we're going to do, but if it makes you feel better to write it as a matrix, it's going to look something like this. Okay? Now, uh, interesting observation about this, and that is that this particular row satisfies that relationship, that row squared equals row. And an interesting feature of this is that this is always true for pure states. Okay. So if I literally just have a single state vector and I form the density matrix, the density matrix can be interesting, but it's always going to square to itself. Okay. Um, and. Uh, now we can compute the von Neumann entropy of this thing by taking minus a uh, trace of rho log rho. And uh, we immediately notice that there's something wonky in here because we have to take the logarithm of a matrix. What is a logarithm? Yes, too young for that commercial. Yes. 
Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? There's a, it was a Taco Bell commercial, and there was a little chihuahua, mm -hmm. and he runs through the living room, and somebody's watching Jeopardy. And Alex Trebek asked this question. I can't remember what the question is, but the answer is logarithm. And the dog stops and looks at the camera and, looks at the camera and goes, what is a logarithm? <laughs> anyway, okay. All right. So, um, <laughs> it's great, you guys. That wasn't that long ago. <laughs> you probably had your heads oh, buried yeah. in video games. Sponsored? Well, that's that game. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so, um, all right. So, how many of you can take the logarithm of a matrix in your head? <laughs> okay, yeah, the logarithm of a diagonal matrix is straightforward. You just take the, the, the logarithms of the diagonals. Um, but we can actually use a trick to calculate this, um, which I think is right. I came up with this like two minutes before I finished writing this. I was like, I don't want to do, I don't want to teach them how to take the logarithm of a matrix. So I figured I would just do this. That's true, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because rho is equal to rho squared. Okay. <laughs> this is a two by two matrix. It's being multiplied by two. So overall, this is four trace rho log rho. If I cancel out the minus trace rho log rho, I've just proven that one is equal to four. Great. Nice. Which is clearly incompatible. So the only resolution to this is that the trace rho log rho is zero, okay? Because otherwise we break math. <laughs> you can actually go and look up how to calculate the trace of a or the, the logarithm of a matrix, calculate the logarithm of that thing, and then do trace log rho log rho, and you'll get zero, okay? But in the end, this thing is the entropy is equal to zero, as we expect, because we've given you a full specification of the state of the system, okay? All right, now, before I continue, and I don't know how far I'm going to get with what I want to continue with, um, before I continue, there's something that I want to say, and that is um, this description has always sort of been predicated on this assumption that I'm telling you what the system is. Of course, I don't have to do that. I could coarse grain, and I could say I'm not going to tell you exactly what the system is. I'm going to give you a few macroscopic quantities. And then you're at best going to know that there's a bunch of states that are compatible with that, and then they're each going to have a probability. And so in that sense, um, we'll have an ensemble, just like the ensembles that we had in statistical mechanics. So we'll have a set of states um, with probabilities. Okay. That is not a superposition state. We do not write it as a superposition state because if I could write it as a superposition state, it's a state. Rather, we have a set of states and each of them has some probability of being the actual state of the system. And we can extend the definition of the density matrix to this ensemble in the following way. So uh, in a sense, a pure state is just a, a, an ensemble where one of the probabilities is one and all the other probabilities are zero. It's exactly the same as what we were using for statistical mechanics earlier, right? The definitions here, though, are in terms of matrices formed from bras and kets. So this is a manifestly quantum mechanical definition. This doesn't apply to classical systems. Okay. All right, now where this story gets interesting, as some of you are aware, is if I start with a pure state, god damn it, why did I erase all that? I needed all that. Shoot. Um, anyway, I'll be all right. Um, where it gets interesting is if we start with a pure state, so some state psi. So I know everything. But then, working in terms of just that pure state, I'm not going to add extra states and create an ensemble. This is the only state in the game, okay? But now I'm going to choose to know even less. Yeah. Now that might seem weird, like how can you start with a full knowledge of the system where there's only one state, but then choose to know less? And the way that we can do that is we can take our system and we can break it up into two pieces 
and say, I only want to know about this piece, and I don't care about that piece. Okay? So if we want to do that, then, um, where am I? There we go. All right, so if we want to do that, then what we can do is, say for example, we want to start with psi, and this is going to be the same state I wrote earlier with the A and the B and the up and the down, and not know anything about the B part of the state. So I want to pretend that I didn't know about B. I only want to know about A. And if I do that, then I can construct what is called the reduced density matrix, which I obtain by tracing over the B part of the density matrix of the full system. Okay? So what does that mean when I say trace? What I mean is something like this. So literally, I take that row matrix that I wrote earlier, I insert it into these two Brockett sandwiches, and then I just evaluate that thing. All of the B parts are going to be are going to disappear because you're always going to be taking combinations of either this, which is one, or this, or you'll do an up and a down, which is zero. Okay? And so you're only going to be left with the A bras and cats, because all the B stuff is going to just combine with your trace operation to get you numbers. Okay? So um, if I do this for the, for the system that I wrote down earlier, and I'm not going to write it down, I wish I hadn't erased it, um, what I find is the following. I find uh, B squared times down A down A plus A squared times up A, up A, okay? And then of course, we want to write that as a matrix, so we can just write it like this. Notice, this is a density matrix, okay? I mean, it's a sum of two density matrices, so it's, it itself is a density matrix. But now, when I calculate the von Neumann entropy of this, well, this is a diagonal matrix, so you can actually take the logarithm pretty easily. And if you calculate the von Neumann entropy of this, you're going to find that it comes out to be, let's write down the answer, where is it? There we go. Uh, minus a squared log a squared minus b squared log b squared. Okay. Now, I don't know what that quantity is without giving you some A's and B's, so let me give you some A's and B's. If A is equal to B is equal to 1 over root 2, that is, remember my original state, okay, I have to write it. So if A and B are 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2, you can plug in 1 over root 2, 1 over root 2 in here, and you find that the von Neumann entropy gives you 2 log 2. Oops. Log 2. Uh, a squared and b squared are both 1 half. Say that again? a squared and b squared are both 1 half, so it's just log 2. Yeah. a squared and b squared are both 1 half, but this is the log of, log of two. 4. Log 2. <laughs> A squared is one half. So. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, log two. And then if you do the base two, you have one half. Log two plus one more. Oh, no, you're right. Yes, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah. And if I instead choose A equals one, B equals zero, then the von Neumann entropy is zero. Uh -huh. Okay. And let's just take a moment and think about these results. Um, this is, should make sense because if A is 1 and B is 0, if I look at the reduced density matrix, this term is not there. And so my reduced density matrix just has one term. But remember, for a pure state, the density matrix looks like this. So if, if A is 1 and B is 0, the reduced density matrix is, or the reduced state is a pure state itself. 
However, if A and B are both non-zero, then I have two terms, right? And this is actually an ensemble. Okay? So what's weird about this, which is sort of new, is that I can take a pure state, something where I know everything, and by just considering a subsystem of it, suddenly I don't know everything. In fact, what we find in this context is that for the von Neumann entropy, you have a different relationship in general between SA and SB, and that is not that they equal SAB, but rather they're greater than or equal to A union B. Okay, so the really radical manifestation of this is I can take a system which has a pure state, so its entropy, its von Neumann entropy is zero, but if I just split it in half, I can have that this half has non-zero entropy and this half has non-zero entropy. That's nothing like what we find in thermal systems. Now, to, to cap this off and just make one final observation and we'll take up the details next time, um, there's one thing you should all observe about what condition you need so that you actually have some non-zero entropy when you focus on a subspace. So looking at this, at the pure state here, so this is A and this is B, Remember, if A is 1 and B is 0, this is a pure state. If these are non -zero, both non-zero, this is not a pure state when you reduce to a subspace. But what do you have quantum mechanically if A and B are non-zero in this case? You have entanglement between A and B. So it turns out that this feature of being able to look at a subset and seeing suddenly non-zero entropy is directly tied to whether the two pieces of the system that you're breaking it up into are entangled with each other or not. Okay, so in this context, where we start with something pure and we end up getting non-zero von Neumann entropies for subsystems, this becomes something that's called entanglement entropy. And entanglement entropy and a lot of the properties of entanglement entropy have been brought to bear in recent years to the black hole information problem. And they've really sharpened the problem. They've actually created new problems over and above what Hawking discovered when he calculated his radiation, and we'll talk about that next time. All right.